From the Toronto Star, I'm Rajiv Mudder, and this matters. When it comes to encounters with police, video has become a safeguard. In the U.S., if you are a person of color stopped by police in traffic, you are probably hitting record on your phone camera before you dig out your license and insurance. But there, the police are likely also recording with their own body cameras. Up until now, body cameras have not been used by major Canadian police forces, except in Calgary, which just started using them last year. There have been pilot projects and tests, but most forces chose against implementing them. However, in light of the Black Lives Matter and defund the police movements, many politicians, including Justin Trudeau, are now pushing their use, and many cities, including Toronto, have now approved their use. Despite being around for almost 15 years, police body cams are still controversial, because while their proponents say they add layers of transparency and accountability, critics say they are expensive and simply don't work. To talk about this, we are joined by Kevin Walby, who's an associate criminal justice professor at the University of Winnipeg. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me on. Body cameras have been around for almost 15 years in certain jurisdictions, but I think one of the places that we have to start is while they're almost everywhere in the States, they're currently only in a few places like Calgary in Canada, but that is about to change. What do you think about sort of the recent movement to have many more forces adopt their use? Well, I think that the timing of it is quite curious because after the police killing of George Floyd, which created a social movement around policing, the likes of which we've never really seen before. Public police, municipal politicians and other politicians were kind of scrambling, I think, to bolster the legitimacy of public police services who were facing all kinds of critiques around their budgets, violence, and so on. That moment where a lot of municipalities, even some that had previously said no to body cameras, return to the issue. Sometimes in news stories or in police communications, we'll hear it, it's about the technology, the technology promotes accountability, but it has to be put in a broader context, I think, of legitimacy of public institutions like policing. So I found the timing really curious, and then I found the decisions to go ahead with body cameras also a little bit confusing and disingenuous in some ways. I'd love to get into that, but I do want to get very much to the basics of this. I think critics of body cameras say that they are expensive and that they don't work, whereas proponents say that they are a modern tool in policing and that they provide a layer of accountability and transparency. Are they both right? Are they both wrong? What do you think? Well, I've looked at a lot of research on body cameras, and I've looked at some of the pilot studies of police organizations themselves, and I tend to disagree with the proponents on a few grounds, and I tend towards agreeing with the critics of body cameras. There's been a lot of research now in the last 15 years. There's studies conducted by police, there's studies conducted by researchers, there's several meta-analyses too, which combine the findings from different studies, and the results are just mixed. So what that means is in a meta-analysis, you might have one or two studies that show some kind of efficacious effect, some decrease in police violence or decrease in claims against police malfeasance. But in another city down the road, you might have the opposite. You might have no change, or you might even in some cases have an increase in police use of force issues and no effect on accountability. So what that means is it is kind of a dud in terms of its level of effectiveness. And this is not according to one study in one place, it's according to the kind of grouped together studies in these meta-analyses. So that raises the question of why invest tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in a technology that has, at best, very mixed results. Now, 
maybe a proponent of the cameras would come back and say, well, if you get a positive result in one city, in one case, isn't that worth it? But I don't think it's that clear cut that the results are always positive. For instance, just yesterday, the body cam footage was released for the incident where the, I believe it was an Oakland police officer, pushed the president of the Raptors, Musai Ajiri, when he was trying to get onto the court. He was caught on this body camera. And some people said, well, the body camera footage shows that the officer is wrong, the officer is lying. It shows that the officer pushes the Raptors president. I'm not sure that it's actually that clear cut in the body cam footage. It is clear cut in the other footage from someone in the crowd who has a really panned out shot. And you can see that the officer actually provokes the encounter and in an unwarranted way pushes Masai Ujiri twice. So it wasn't really the body cam footage. It's not that clear cut. In fact, their bodies go in and out of the frame. The hands go in and out of the frame. And what's disconcerting about that is it lends itself to interpretations that, that are not accurate or truthful. It lends itself to a kind of set of claims around what did happen, what didn't happen, that an anthropologist named Charles Goodwin referred to as professional vision. Goodwin was writing about the Rodney King beating, which wasn't a body cam. It was a different kind of visualization of police conduct. But he looked at the case of those officers in the courtroom interpreting this, what appeared to be clear-cut video evidence, right? It, it looks pretty clear-cut. But in a broader context of claims-making and police testimony in a court, what police did is they said, well, you can't see what's happening here. Only we can truly interpret what's happening here. Rodney King's trying to get up. Rodney King's trying to be violent. Rodney King is trying to agitate, so we had to continue to use force. And they won, right? That's what led to the, the massive upheaval in L.A. I am really glad that you brought up the Masai Jiri thing, because the thing is, I was going to say that I thought, from what I saw from the body cam, it completely exonerated him. It exonerates Masai Jiri? I don't know if that's necessarily true. What I'm trying to say is that you have to look at what happens in a court how police testimony is given, how that testimony is treated by a judge. And yeah, it looks clear cut. It looks like it exonerates him, right? Didn't the video look like it exonerated Rodney King and showed those officers who beat Rodney King to be guilty? They were found not guilty. So that, that's what I'm saying is you can't just look at it as simply as saying, well, the video is clear cut. It provides this clear cut evidence. You have to look at how the video is used in court, how it's interpreted. In an era of erosion and trust in police, don't we need them to add a layer of accountability and act as a digital witness? Well, that's not exactly the case. Uh, some of these studies have found on their own or in combination in a meta-analysis that violence goes up, that police use of force goes up. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the videos are provided in a way that leads to prosecution of officers or disciplining of officers. So I don't think it provides the big boost in terms of police accountability that the companies that sell the cameras say they do, that police say they do. I don't think the boost is that big at all, if it's there whatsoever. I think it's extremely limited, the kind of accountability that could come from it. So you then have to ask, is it worth the public dollars? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth 
all of the overhead and extra costs, the rolling costs that are involved, besides the massive first-time expenditure for the cameras, it creates a lot of problems in terms of administering the files, in terms of storing the files. And that's why some police services before this year, some big police services in Canada said, we studied it, we looked at it, we didn't find a big boost, we didn't find a big effect, and we're not going to do it. We're not going to buy the cameras. It would be too big of an administrative headache for us. And they said no. That's why I think it's a little bit disingenuous for politicians and some of the very same police services to come back to the issue now when police are under a lot of criticism for their budgets and for police violence to say, look, we've got the fix here. We've got body cameras. The evidence just isn't that clear cut on the accountability side or on the prosecution side. We should just say, obviously, they were, I mean, George Floyd's death was videotaped. Of course, that is now having an effect. Breonna Taylor, I believe, as well. And body cameras are all over the U.S., and obviously, they have not solved their policing problems. No, body cameras are in around 85, 87% of police services in the United States, and it has not stopped violence. It has not stopped brutality. And even in a case such as George Floyd, all of the officers had on body cameras. And you can see in the body camera footage that's been released that the actual incident isn't captured on the body camera. The knee to the neck and the other knees on his back and torso are not really captured in the body camera footage. They're captured on citizen cell phone camera footage, but not on the body cameras. So that's why I'm saying there are lots of limits to what comes in and out of the frame of a body camera, and that's why they're not providing this kind of conclusive, clear-cut evidence. I think it will always be contested by police officers, by police unions, and because of this issue of professional vision, the kind of weight that police testimony is given in court is not going to be a big boost in accountability. Completely agree that they're not a panacea or a magic bullet. But from what we have learned about the studies, what about the procedures around them? Is there a sense of best practices? I know that in some cases, you know, there are forces where the police officers can just turn them on or off. Is there a way to actually use these things in a beneficial way? Well, I think that there's that issue of being turned off and on. There's the issue of technical failure, of the feed failing to send, of also in the Canadian climate. The technology just failing due to cold weather, which has been found in a police study in Canada. There's a lot of technicalities to their use, and I don't know if there's a way to ratchet them up so that they can become more efficacious. The way that I think of them is in a broader political economy kind of sense. The companies that own body cameras are what is now called Axon. It used to be called Taser. So they're selling other technological devices to police. Motorola also sells body cameras now. And they sell a lot of things like 911 call centers and information communication technology suites for police. So they're rolled into this package. And it's not so much about providing accountability. It's not so much about making sure that police are serving the public I think that's really rhetorical and it should be seen as advertising spin. Uh, What it's really about is selling the bigger suite of technological fixes that Motorola, that Axon, that other companies like Digital Ally are selling to police. It's about their bottom line. And I think that for police, it's about a legitimation crisis. I think before 2020, we saw a lot of police in Canada reject them because they didn't feel like it was going to help them in one way or another. And quite frankly, they weren't under the same kind of legitimacy crisis that they are now. And now with the defund police movement in cities all across Canada, it's very curious that it's back on the table, that some have decided to move forward with it. I think it has to be put in a broader kind of context of political economy, of rhetoric and communications. It's not just about the devices and their technical 
efficacy. You've already talked about politicians being disingenuous, you know, in light of the defund the police movement. Do you think that, you know, these approvals are basically action or being seen as taking some sort of action? Well, I think there's such a diverse landscape of people out there with very opposing views of what police do in society. There's been some interesting public opinion polling on how a lot of younger Canadians from different communities, different backgrounds, are really seeing the merit of the defund police message and that there's an age-related effect where people who are older, who are property-owning, maybe don't see it in the same way. Maybe they want to have police around and not defund it. I think that it was just too quick the way that Trudeau came out and said the RCMP should have body cameras after they were involved in beating up some Indigenous people, killing Indigenous people in Eastern Canada. It was just too quick the way Toronto moved to put body cameras back on the table in the face of a massive social movement for defunding with very articulate points around public and social policy and community development. So it was not a quick technological fix. It was a quick political fix for police and for politicians to try to quell the social movements that have emerged and try to gain support among those constituents who maybe aren't as convinced by the defund message. Play devil's advocate. If I was the family of Regis Kuchapachinsky, who was a woman who passed away in Toronto with six police officers alone in an apartment with her, I mean, that's some footage I would want to see just to know what actually happened in there. What do you say to that? I would say that for mental health calls, calls of distress, we don't need to send six police officers. We don't need to send police officers at all. We need to do a much better job at having a bigger amalgam of professionals who aren't simply out to use force first to deal with mental health and distress calls. Police really should not have been there first through the door. They often aggravate those kinds of encounters and create a lot of distress, fright, and fear for people. I would also say even if police officers were sent to such a call, if they were wearing body cameras, like I mentioned earlier, hands, feet, people are going to be in and out of the frame. They capture very little of an actual encounter. They're not clear cut. The audio is sometimes on, it's sometimes off. They don't have to opt in to have the audio. And so I don't think it would necessarily help at all in such a situation. And as I I noted, such video, even if it seems really clear cut, can be spun a different way in a court of law, can be interpreted by police using professional vision in a way to contest the claims of the persons who've suffered the grievance. In that exact situation, such a terrible and sad event that has happened, I would say police don't need to be there in the first place. And if they did have on body cameras or head cameras, if they had microphones on, it's not going to provide the accountability that the companies that sell the technologies say that it will. And even if you get a clear cut picture of something, it will be contested by police, by police unions in the courts. It'll be fought tooth and nail to interpret it a different way than it appears to everyone else. Well, I mean, it was one of the points I actually wanted to bring up about when we were talking about Masai Ujiri in that the police there had that footage and still wanted to charge him. Yeah, there's a disparity in information access with body cameras and with other types of information that police collect. There isn't public access. If you submit something like an FOI request, it'll be blocked under sections pertaining to ongoing investigations. And so that points to the kind of disingenuous nature of the process. And I think the issue of information control is really central here. It's not more information for the public necessarily. It's not more information for prosecutors or defense counsel, depending on the case, who are representing members of the public. It's more information for police. It's actually more power for police and it's more resources for police. That's why it flies in the face of the defund movement so blatantly, because the defund movement is calling for less power, for less resources, for fewer opportunities for police to engage in 
violence in situations where it's not warranted, where we could do better as a society to address harm, transgression, distress, without adding harm to the equation, without adding violence to the equation. On that note, I want to thank you so much for your time and the lightness on this topic. Thank you very much. Kevin Walby is an associate criminal justice professor at the University of Winnipeg. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajin Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.